Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Hassan Sabah with us today. Hey, Hassan. Um, hi, Frank. And I'm happy to be invited to this chat, actually, to talk about our paper. Well, thank you very much for writing that very lovely article and being willing to talk about it. It's great. We'll, we'll get yep. there. Very cool. Uh, Hassan, where are you located at? I actually work in Toulouse, so it has been 10 years that I'm here. And it's a very lovely area, I would say, in terms of um, weather and food, especially. Oh, well, food. So... Oh, I mean, you know, <laughs> what are we to say about that? <laughs> so you have good university, good weather, and good food. So right. you should be happy as a researcher, I would say. Well, so, I'm gonna yeah. have to. I'm gonna have to come and visit you over in France. And of course, there. you will be welcome. Have a, we can have a meal. We can share some fine French wine. It'll be great. Exactly. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Uh, yeah, it is July seventh on 2022 as we shoot this, and summer is in full roll in Phoenix, and uh, I imagine it is in France as well. Or are you guys hot this year? Because sometimes I hear that you guys get heat waves rolling. Yeah, actually, we get like a very big. Uh, heat weather back to weeks back and that was exceptional because we had that generally in july august but not mm -hmm. in june so that was very bad i would say for some agriculture people mm -hmm. because it was very warm like strictly very warm going up to 40 degrees celsius mm -hmm. i'm very wow. bad with fahrenheit even though i lived like three years in california but i still very bad with fahrenheit <laughs> <laughs> and temperature units, I would well 40c say. sounds like something in phoenix or something like that exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> right well it'll still keep the wine and the food so i'll be visiting yep. <laughs> very cool uh, Hassan, what do you like to do for research? Actually, it has been, I would say, at least 12 or 13 years that I like to analyze basically astro material, cool. the ones that we synthesize in lab, or mm -hmm. actually the ones that we can receive for free, such as meteorites or sample return mission. So, yeah, it gives us a hint basically on the chemistry of what's going on outside our Earth and how things go on. No. So yeah, mostly, mostly I like developing experimental technique to be able to probe these kinds of material or to analyze the molecular composition of this material cool. and apply that to astrophysical, basically problematics that we have. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Actually, actually, to make it short, basically in this paper we talk about fullerenes, but I spent most of my research working on PAH, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, mm -hmm. from astro point of view and from chemistry point of view. So yeah. yeah. Very nice. And that is going to bring us to this very lovely APJ article. It's open access, people. It's free. You can go get it. Grab it. <laughs> Detection of cosmic fullerenes in the Almahada Sita meteorite. Are they interstellar heritage? And Hassan, take us away. Yes, actually, this work is, I would say, it's related somehow to my postdoctoral work mm -hmm. on Almahada Sita. So mm -hmm. the whole idea actually was a collaboration between Peter Janiskens and me when I used to be a postdoctoral student in the group of, uh, of Dixair actually at Stanford University. Mm -hmm. And one day I didn't know him before. And one day Peter showed up at the lab saying, you know what, we have very exciting meteorite. It was, in 2010, it was one of the first meteorite detected outside space and we recovered it like very quickly. Cool. So that was very nice. And mm -hmm. we worked on that and whatever the history came up. And when I get installed in Toulouse with a new experimental setup that we use here. Okay. So I work most of the time with Christine Joblin, which is also the research director of the program that I work. Mm -hmm. Michael Carlos was a PhD student that worked with me during the past uh, three years, actually. Yeah, in France, the PhD is a three years. It's not like five, six years, five, I would say. Years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how nice, how nice. Yeah. <laughs> and Mohamia is one of the responsible of this meteorite back at the University of Khartoum, who organized basically the consortium on site to collect it. Uh -huh. And Serena Goodrich also is one of the PI of this uh, Almahatta Sita meteorite, and she is an expert on the Uralite formation body. So that was very nice. Okay. And at the end of the day, someone joined us who is Jean Dupré, actually. Oh, he is okay. from the Sorbonne. So he is mostly physics, physics nuclear uh, expert and cosmo, okay. 
more about cosmochemistry and stuff like this because detecting molecule and we talk about it detecting this molecule could be easy somehow if you have the right experimental technique but explaining how they come here that is was the most tough part i would say <laughs> we will go through this <laughs> So, so yeah, the motivation of the paper basically was to, we had the spectrum, the mass spectrum of al Mahatta Sita when I used to work at Stanford. So to do that, we use a special technique that has been pioneered by Dixer at Stanford actually, to probe polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon and meteorites. It's called a laser desorption, laser ionization in two mm -hmm. steps. And that's the originality of the setup that you don't choose one laser as 99% of the people use in their laboratory in analytical chemistry, but you separate the phase on the process of desorption and ionization. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this technique is very sensitive and allow us to detect this pH. Cool. However, the spectrum that we recorded back at Stanford we had a lot of peaks that we were unable to tell that these are PAHs and we were unable to give the chemical formula yeah. because the mass resolution of the apparatus was basically not sufficient to do this actually. Okay. And yeah, and what, when we had this new machine at uh, basically at here in Toulouse that I built it with a Greek company, the al Mahatta Sitta meteorite was one of on the highest of priority to be analyzed, to be able to, to track these peaks that we have from carbonaceous material and we are unable to detect them basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the work is started and we have this detection. And the nice part about it is that the, the whole question, if you want about meteorites, that's that about the research team that we are doing that. In meteorites in general, you see small polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. However, in interstellar medium, you, you, you were supposed to see big stuff, big polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, having carbon number above 50, basically, to be able to survive in these uh, extreme conditions, actually. Okay. And C60 is one of these, basically, cousin of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. And people start looking at that back in 1997 with Baker, actually, who published a paper on detection of C60. Okay. However, other laboratory basically didn't accept the result because they were unable to reproduce it. Ah. And as you may know also that the C60 basically, Kroto, how he gets the Nobel Prize, he hit with a laser on a graphite surface and he synthesized basically the C60. So the whole question was with Baker, did you detect the C60 in the concentrated whatever carbonaceous part of the yeah, yeah. yeah. Or did you synthesize it during the analysis of process? So oh, that yeah. was a big <laughs> debate. In situ, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that was a big debate back in mm -hmm. 1997 to 2008. And one of the students of Dixer repeated the experiment and showed it could, it could be an artifact, actually. It's not a detection. It's interesting. Okay. So, um, so my collaborator, which is Christine Joblin, and this research, she's very knowledgeable about PAH and C16 in the interstellar medium. And that was always this question, why we don't see them in meteorites, right? <laughs> so we look to the mass spectrum of al Mahatta set as a back one, and we see that we go up in mass up to 330, 350, okay. and we are unable to analyze that. So this, 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 the idea was to go and to analyze. So we get the first mass spectrum in the range of 100 to 350, okay. which, is one, which is on the figure number two or three, I think. Let's take that. And yeah, this will not be linear, but that will allow me oh, okay. to tell the real story actually about the detection, if you want, stories, uh, Frank. Stories are good. Stories are good. So here's figure two. Is this the one you want? No, not this one. The third, actually. Third one? So the third, uh, yeah, I don't, not at all. No, sorry. I'm missing. It's, uh, sorry. It's the one that shows the chemical diversity, sorry, on figure five, basically. Figure five. We'll go to figure five. Yeah. So when you see the mass spectrum from 150 to 500, you could see that you have, for example, like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon with their formula such as C14H10 near to C15. Mm -hmm. That show you how we can separate mm -hmm. between basically nice. 
a 15 hydrogen atom and one, uh, sorry, 12 hydrogen atom and one carbon atom. That's okay. C16 and C15, H12. Mm -hmm. The most remarkable, basically, fingerprint was starting at 360 to 380. As you can see, you go from C28, C29, C30, C31, C32. Uh -huh. And after that, you started jumping by two carbon atoms. Okay, yes. Uh -huh. C30, C34, C36. So mm -hmm. we stopped here because the signal dropped. And in general, in mass spectrometry, you have like a kind of a blob and the signal dropped. Yeah, and we didn't go upper than that, and we were discussing this inside the project, inside, and everybody tell me, "Asan, did you see that before?" I told them, "No, that is the first time that we see that." Cool. So that was very exciting because yeah. switching from one carbon atom to two carbon atom, that means that you are probably having a fillering chemistry that could synthesize C sixty and C seventy. Mm -hmm. So we start having a big issue in thinking about stuff because uranolites are not that primitive meteorites. They have been differentiated. So they have been yes. heating up to 1,000, 1,600 degrees Celsius. And they are not considered as carbonaceous chondrite, even though the original parent body was a carbonaceous chondrite before differentiation, actually. Mm -hmm. So the question was, why we see this inside this mass spectrum, like on uralites and not like in other carbonaceous chondrite? Fair enough. So we decided to go further, and that's going to bring us probably to the figure two, where we see basically the, the filler in distribution. And we started basically by sample number four, which is one of the button on, yeah. So spectrum number four, that was the first fragment that we analyzed at Stanford. We wanted to repeat the same experiment actually. Mm -hmm. And we start seeing these fillerings. So basically during this analysis, Peter Jeniskin was visiting Toulouse oh, to wow. give us a seminar in the lab. And we said, you know what? We should try to do this experiment together. So we analyzed al mahatta Sitta in the presence of Peter because one of the PI of the system. And with my student, we start seeing this carbon cluster and fillerin again. And we start saying, is this real? Or, you know, <laughs> it's a laser yeah. Yeah. sound job. <laughs> I mean, 48 is so spectacular. We lowered the laser power to the lowest Possible. power Exactly. And yeah. basically at yeah. this yeah. at this level, you are we are around like 20 times less than the threshold of ablation, where you could expect to generate whatever chemistry inside the probe. Right. Mm -hmm. So at this day, Peter was very excited. Christine oh. was very excited. Everybody was very excited except me because I oh. didn't want to go through the same story about, you know. The other people who detected fullerenes and it was not detection basically. Right, right. You would say um, conservative. Oh, we <laughs> exactly. That exactly is a part because you know we have been looking for this uh, extremely stable molecule. It's one of the it's the largest molecule detected in space in the interstellar medium and in planetary nuclei, and it's one of the most stable. Why we don't detect it in meteorites? That's the people were asking. You know. Okay. Mm -hmm. So after the after the leave of Peter from the visit in Toulouse, we continue working on that. And we went through basically the sample 04, 22, 24, 27. Uh -huh. And we were always seeing this detection. I said, Hassan, no, actually, we are creating that, even though I know that the laser is much more lower. Okay. So, so we went through a whole collection of al Mahatta so 13 meteorite, and we start seeing that in some of them, we see fillerines, and in some of them, we don't see fillerines. Yeah. Here, the story start to be more interesting because, you know, you have a discrimination between different type of meteorite of al mahatta Sita. So we say it's a good idea. Okay. And actually, to, to, to tackle down the question about are you forming fillerines or not forming fillerines, we decided to, to do the experiment that is on figure three. Figure three. So if you go on figure three, we could see basically three mass spectrum. Yeah. The one starting from 150 millijoule per, per centimeter square, that is really one of the lowest desorptions that you can see in any experimental setup using IR 
uh, laser at 1064 nanometer. Basically, you are putting, Frank, less than one electron volt in one uh, photon uh, stuff. Uh -huh. okay. So you cannot do that much. So we took basically very, very, we, what they call it, highly polycrystallized uh, graphite. The graphite this is the most pure graphite that you can get basically yeah. from we get that from our collaborator in madrid and actually for our surprise at the lowest desorption 150 we didn't get even carbon cluster we don't get right. we don't destroy the surface to get carbon coming out from the surface yes at doubling the desorption we start seeing stuff between 100 and 300 mm -hmm. and going to even 1000 and basically all the experiments that have been done in this paper has been working with a 300 millijoule per centimeter uh, square. Okay. But we said, you know what? We need to tackle that more. We wanted to triple yeah. going to one sub. Yeah. And even with that, we don't see any fullerene generation from this part. Mm -hmm. So in terms of desorption, we are pretty sure that we don't synthesize fillerines even from a pure graphite source cool so, excellent excellent like that we Same. eliminated this problem yeah mm -hmm. we took this problem to elimination basically correct but that was not basically enough i would say to be able to tackle that down and we went through different different measurements so in figure four which is just below the figure three mm -hmm. yeah we did a lot of calibration measurement if we can call them so on this picture, which is a bit complicated to explain, so you have the F desorption and F ionization, and you have the number 150, 20, 320, 312. Okay. That's varying desorption and ionization. Yeah. And actually, to see if your distribution, we split the carbon in three groups, basically between 48 and 58, which some people could call these are a fragment of C60 because they could fragment. Sure. And the most intense one between C60 and C70, the most stable one, and the one above C70 because they were minor. Yes. As you can see on the figure, because we should tell, I would say, the audience that uh, laser desorption ionization technique is not very quantitative, a semi-quantitative technique, because you have the laser stability, uh, the matrix effect, uh, the matrix roughness, I would say, yeah. uh, how it absorbs. But generally, you heat up the sample at very uh, small amount of time, few nanoseconds. So mm -hmm. you favor Dang. you favor desorption over decomposition, as you can do if you are heating resistive heat, basically. Yes. The pictures that we show here, it shows that a different experimental setup from 150 desorption to 450, the distribution of the three group of fullerenes is pretty much similar in what yeah. we call the quantitative part of our instrument. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we say, you know what? We know we wanted to go for the, the different samples that we have, and we did the same the same measurement, like the 3B exactly, to show how this distribution are somehow a little bit heterogeneous and different of them, especially the one yeah. above C70, yeah. were very different from one yeah. to another. Because yep. all these fragments were urolite. So you think if they have the same lithology or the same matrix and you are creating the chemistry, you should create the same species. There is no reason that you create in this one, this part, and the other one, the other part. Right. So that was also very helpful for us to see a little bit of yeah. heterogeneity distribution right. between the molecules. Yes. And if I can come back to the figure number one, I would say, to just to explain a little bit the experimental technique for non -ast for astrophysical people, generally they are not very knowledgeable about, I would say, analytical chemistry uh, mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. So actually, yeah. our sample could mm -hmm. be monitored with a camera in real time, so you could observe where the laser hit on your sample in real time, like that you can pick up a fresh area if you would like each time. Yes. And the laser spot is a 300 micron. And as you, as it's represented now, as it, actually as it is inside the experiment. So the sample is in basically in vertical mode. Okay. And you get the laser desorption from the side. 
mm-hmm. your plume basically go to the skimmer orifice to the ionic fat, and you hit with the UV laser to be ionized. And something very interesting in this okay. is that when we were hitting with the laser, we were blocking the UV laser. When you block the UV laser, you don't see fillerines. Which means another another time that you don't synthesize them. You need the UV to be able to see them, which means that you're just absorbing a neutral molecule from the surface, and you need the UV to be able to synthesize. Because if you are using one laser, let's say IR or UV, and you're disorbing on a material, and you see fullerenes, you create basically radical ions that you can do chemistry and you will generate basically fullerene ionic fullerene sections. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So the fact that we don't see with one laser any fullerenes, that means we are just absorbing a neutral fullerene from the sample okay. softly and we need the UV to be able to ionize. Actually, our uh, ionization technique is called a resonance enhanced multiphoton ionization, very known in the okay. community. Wow. The wavelengths is really chosen for to be sensitive to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon okay. and to be sensitive to fullerenes. Okay. Because some people tell me, okay, Hassan, why you are targeting pH? I told them if I want to target all the molecules that are in meteorite, I could spend my life analyzing on mass spectrum. I don't want mm-hmm. that. <laughs> in Murchison, it has been analyzed by high, higher mass resolution. And it was a paper, very nice paper of Schmidt Copeland actually who dissolve material, organic material in meteorites. And he shows that you have at least 10,000 molecular formula, which means that the diversity wow. is a huge. Yeah. I wow. don't want to go through this. I want to be limited to the part I'm interested in. <laughs> so for the, basically our technique is extremely sensitive. We are sensitive to the atomal level. Yeah. And we made an estimation with a molecule such as coronin or fullerenes, you can detect few tens of thousands of molecule per laser shot, basically. Ooh, good. So after the ions are created, we oh. have something very interesting. We have an ionic trap. It's especially designed called it linear quadrupole ionic trap in which we have different segments. And in these segments, you can in first segment or in one of these segments, you can isolate like specific species. Yes. And also you can make it reacting with gases, with radical, with electrons, but also you can uh, send it to another segment inside the trap where you can study photo dissociation. So basically the trap has two mm-hmm. optical holes and you can go through your laser to dissociate your molecule to be able to reproduce its structure very finely actually. Cool. So... And after that, we go for the time of flight, which is the mass separations that give us this mass resolution. Uh-huh. But the setup was unique. Now we have a second version of this and another lab in Lille. So you work with this setup to be able to analyze basically carbonaceous molecule in suit and environmental same collection. Okay. So, yeah. And oh I would say I, I worked a lot with experimental setup laser mass spectrometry. And I worked with the one at Stanford, but it didn't have ionic trap. It was just L2MS, like laser dissociation, laser ionization, going to time of flight. The fact that we put this ionic trap in the middle yeah. increases the sensitivity for really humongous amount. Like, nice. I would say I used to be working with one meteorite sample at Stanford for half an hour, an hour. And after that, your signal will drop, of course. Okay. On this meteorites, yesterday, I analyzed the sample for just to make a test because we are running some other sample. Okay. So three years after I analyzed the sample for the same one, I was able to reproduce the same mass distribution with some elements that are missing. Yeah. <laughs> that means that you are really having a very sensitive technique, basically. In the stable. That's what made us detect the fullerenes inside, actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... That's about, I would say, the experimental technique. And Mm -hmm. the other question was, because especially Peter and Serena and Christine was not knowledgeable. She's more astrophysics and planetology and, let's say, solar system bodies such as meteorites. So everybody was saying, you know what, how you could detect C60 inside meteorites such as Eurolite, this one, 
Yeah. And you don't detect it in Murchison because the first paper with this experimental setup was on Murchison meteorites. And we didn't detect basically any fillers. And we didn't detect this carbon cluster. Okay. That brings us, if you want, uh, Frank, to the figure number six, Did you see just it? to show yeah. the diversity or the chemical diversity difference. And since we talked about one equation inside all this paper, so inside this paper, we have equation one, which gives you what we call it DBE. DBE is double bound equivalent for chemists. It gives you a hint about the aromaticity of this molecule. So to calculate this DBE, you need to know basically your carbon number, your hydrogen number, and your nitrogen number. In mm -hmm. our case, we don't attribute molecule with nitrogen because we are strict to uh, uh, hydrocarbon. So by knowing your formula of C and H, you can automatically calculate your DBE. Uh -huh. This technique has been invented, I would say, or really pioneered by Alan Marshall, I would say, and other people who work with extremely high resolution stuff, like they have a, a mass resolution in their FTICR that can go to a few millions. Wow. We okay. still in a few 10,000, yeah. So if I see two peaks around 202, my friends used to say that in their machine, they can see hundreds of peaks around So they invented, they invented somehow, because looking to a mass spectrum, as you can see, let's say in the figure just before this one, figure five, mm -hmm. It's for experts, you can tell what you are seeing with the formula and with the distribution. But for any other guy, sometimes the mass spectrum is not talking. Actually, you can see, okay, masses at different mass. You can see some formula. So the projection of the mass spectrum in two dimension is the use of double bound equivalent for aromatic compound, basically. Okay. So if we go, if we go to figure six, yeah. We calculate the DBE of all the identified chemical formula using the equation number one that we show. Mm -hmm. And after that, we divide that by C number. And yeah. that you could define it for pure hydrocarbon as the aromaticity factor. Yeah, and that allow, uh -huh. allow you basically to have a, a view on the families. Because in a general, uh, I would say in natural chemistry, you don't synthesize, let's say, just C16H10. Like it doesn't come just up at C60. It should be a group of pH yes. coming. Yes. As you can see in a blue in the sample AHS58, you have a group of pH between C10 and C20. Yes. So they don't come alone, basically. If you are alone, you could think about sometimes contamination because how they come, these things. Yeah, so we draw this line from basically the work of Alan Marshall and other people. So <laughs> if you have any DBE over C less than 0 0.5, you are most probably not having an aromatic structure, but mostly aliphatic or a chain structure. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Between the two lines where I put PAH, these are mostly PAH. You could add some other line, but I didn't want to make this more complicated, but you can add more line nice. to define what we call pericondensed and catacondensed pH, like different structure, how they are symmetric, how they are condensed. And the most interesting part is this line exactly of fillerines and carbonic cluster. Yeah. So you can see the difference between two Almahatta ah. samples, the urolite one on the top and the non urolite one on the bottom. Yeah. And you can see and you can screen the huge difference. All the Almahatta Sitta sample has pH, has polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, all mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. But the ones that have fullerene have additionally a huge amount of carbonic cluster and some what we call them, we don't find the name, so we call them hydrogenated carbonic cluster. Okay. So carbonic cluster oh, oh, are the one okay. with a pure okay. carbon. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the planar aromatic line, which is the orange line, it has been defined by the work of Alan Marshall and collaborator, okay. where basically they run ton of sample with uh, basically high resolution mass spectrometer, and they didn't find any pl planar aromatic molecule that could have a DBE over C above this point, actually. Okay. That's okay. made you think, if you want, Frank, that any points that you could have between orange and the fullerene are mostly molecules that are curved structure. So you start this stripping basically maybe PAH, and you get your ball closing up shell and other type. Uh-huh. 
So this DBE over C let us basically straight away split things in family instead of splitting things in peak and mass spectrum. We can see the molecules and we can see houses. And you can see also the difference in carbonaceous intensity, even though we are not quantitative, but we could have a hint about it. So the, the pH inside al Mahatta Sita, you can see them, they are colored in red and wine, which means that they are very intense. Mm -hmm. And the one non neurolite you can see the signal is very low. We yeah. have them, but they are not intense. But pH are in all the sample. And that's what makes us confident about the new result, because in 2010, on our first paper at Stanford, we analyzed basically nine, seven to nine samples, and they all contained pHs. Okay. And here in this paper, we had the same result. All the sample analyzed contain pH, but not all of them contain fullerenes and carbonic cluster, actually. Fair enough. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. So that's allowed us to start thinking about the difference about this molecule, and we decided to plot in figure seven, basically, the distribution of family per per uh, molecules or per uh, sample, sorry. Okay. So you have fillerines, PAHs, HC cluster, and carbonic cluster. So okay. PAH, as you can see, they are everywhere in yeah. all yeah. in all the sample of al Mahatta Sita, which really mm -hmm. confirms the result of 10 years back. So here we were very happy. Good. Carbon cluster, as you can see, and the, the urolite one are with the gray bars, actually. The non urolite one okay. are mostly chondrides, sulfide, or whatever. I'm not the expert in this. But you can see the drop in signal in carbon cluster. So the whole yeah. question that we still think about it, we don't see fillerines in this one. Is this related to the matrix carbon that we have and it's not enrichized inside the non neurolite one. So uh -huh. for that, you don't see fullerenes because we are detecting basically this level of a few ppm of fullerenes. We estimate it to be few ppm. Okay. So if you can look the carbon cluster signal in the non neurolite sample 41, 58, 1001, 1002, 1054, and 2012, yeah. it's extremely low compared to the urolite one. That means that the phase of carbon yes. that you have is mm. probably not that much concentrated like in the urolite. And probably for this reason, we were unable to detect fullerenes in the other type of lithology inside this meteorite. Okay. Still to be proved, <laughs> but yeah. that is one of our thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. So we can see clearly that the carbon cluster and fullerene are somehow related. But the problem is that carbon cluster signal could come from basically graphite, any size of carbon, and could come from molecular phase. Yep. So this has to be basically more studied and later on in other type of, of sample. So now we went through basically to study in figure eight, we wanted to do the same thing that we did it with the fullerenes, but to look to the carbon cluster. And as we can see, we split the carbon cluster in a three main three main uh, sample, exactly three main groups, eight to 17, 18 to 29, and 30 to 40. Okay. And the ones that are most dominant basically are the two first group. Oh, yeah. But you can see again some heterogeneity between the sample. Yeah. And yeah. something that we didn't we didn't talk a lot about it in this paper, but somehow we explain it that we analyze a lot of dust analog. And one of our nice experiments that we did basically back in time, that using a stardust machine in Madrid in this Lando Cosmos project, because this work is funded and been funded by, by this, we detect, we synthesize basically carbon dust, uh, sorry, carbon, cosmic carbon analog cosmic dust analog, sorry, using uh, atomic source of carbon. And we didn't see PAH until you add C2H2, basically. And here we see that PAH and carbon cluster are not related. So our hint was okay. at the first part, from okay. astrophysical point of view, interstellar people working, is that what we are seeing are mostly synthesized around the stars. Even though in the star dust machine, we are unable to produce fillerines, Okay. Because basically the temperature and energy you are unable to go to 2,500. But the only way that you could synthesize fullerene is that you need extremely high temperature. You need 2,000, 2,500 and so on. 
Uh-huh. So mm-hmm. we start thinking and comparing these things. But at the same time, we said, you know, since Baker detected fillerines in, uh, in alien meteorites, why we don't try alien meteorites? Because we tried Mercer yeah. and different why not? Why not? One more. So figure nine, we tried to work with this. And basically, we have a spectrum yeah. of a pure PAH with no carbon cluster and with even no fillerines. Wow. There is a data also we didn't publish in this paper. We analyzed, Frank, the, this is an internal sample from the Allende rock, basically. Mm-hmm. And basically, we have one collaborator in Madrid. He gave us also the crust fusion of Allende. Oh, so okay. the material that was heated during the atmospheric entry, uh-huh. even with this one, we didn't publish because we want to make another paper with other stuff. Okay. But we have basically PAHs going to C60, C70, C80. In that cross. And we don't see fillings. And that's what you see as a big PAH. Basically, you are heating up your small PAHs that are on the surface, and you are creating combustion chemistry that grew up basically your, your pH. But even with that, we don't see fillings. That means that the atmospheric entry of the most carbonaceous material will not to produce mostly probably fillings on the surface. Okay. That was the test because one of the idea was, did you produce these fillings during the atmospheric entry? Yes. So yeah. we don't think so <laughs> okay. because we tried on a more carbonaceous chondrite zone than al mahatta Sitta and we didn't find this actually. Mm-hmm. I'm with so you. we go on, yeah. We go on figure 10 if you want. Sure. To, to, to show this discrepancy between Allende and Murchison. So Murchison is one of the most studied uh, uh, meteorite for its organic contents. Mm-hmm. So this result was from the old paper. As, as you can see, PAH are really concentrated between, let's say, C8 and C25. Allende is less rich, or the sample that we had was less rich in PAHs. Yeah, it still kind of pops And off. you can see in both of them, you don't have carbon cluster. You could have some small hydrogenated carbon cluster at low mass, C9, C8, C10, uh-huh. C11. Uh-huh. And if you look to AHS 1002, it has some PAH similar a little bit to Allende and Mercer. Right. Mm-hmm. And actually, these are just descriptive, I would say, uh, comparison. Now we are working on a software that we want to automatize to be able to get fingerprint of different meteorites and be able to compare these species in real time. Got it. Quantitatively. Yep. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And if you look now to the AHS04 in the same zoom, so we didn't go up to fillery, you can see this carbon cluster and hydrogenated carbon cluster. And so there is more diversity in this one than the other one. Absolutely. So the good question was is what was to estimate the concentration of PAH inside Al Mahatta Sitta. We don't have a quantitative method, if you want, but I repeat it that people studied a lot Murchison mm-hmm. and they studied it with gas chromatography, whatever. So yeah. they estimated the, 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 the concentration of PAH in Murchison to be around the 20 ppm. Okay. And if we go to, to figure 11, that will be talking about this, I would say, give, mm-hmm. give yeah, us yeah. a hint. Of, that show us basically uh, the sample and the distribution. So we plotted PAH, and Dean and Pyrene are two PAH that are very known. I will say why we pick up them. Okay. And the other family are HC cluster, carbon cluster, and fillings. Yes. So as you can see, in all the meteorite, PAH dominates. So we compared yeah. the concentration that we have from Murchison and with the signal, the one with AHS, they should be the same. So you should be around 10 ppm for PAH in al mahatta Sitta. So fillerines in that case are somehow compared with one order of magnitude less, wow. which allow us basically to say that the distribution of fillerines that you have is a few ppm. So you need a very sensitive experiment because the quantity of carbon inside your light are extremely small, less less concentrated than Murchison, and you have a few ppm. Yes. So I made some, some estimation. In Murchison, if we take one milligram, generally we have 50 nanogram. 
So in general, we put one to two milligram on our sample and your laser shot is around the 300 micro over six millimeter diameter. Right. So basically you are looking for femtogram per laser shot to be able to detect them. <laughs> wow. So yeah. Wow. Here is the difficulties. That is the main difficulties of probing yeah. this native basically material inside. Yeah. And then it's a new molecule. It's the first PAH that has been detected in space by its rotational uh, spectrum. Vibration. And yeah. has been detected in 2021. Mm -hmm. And that is the first because yeah. PAH has been detected for a long time yeah. in, uh, in an interstellar medium, but none of them has been identified. So the idea was to just to plot. Pyrene is the most famous because there is a big role for pyrene in the synthesis of PAHs and mm -hmm. to grow up for higher molecules. So as we can see, alien demersion, they contain just PAH and some HC cluster. Yeah. But the spectrum of, we go again, the spectrum of fluorolite is really special and especially this fluorolite. So here is, it comes the big story because I told you the nice part about this paper. Okay. <laughs> It has been three years we are going through the reviewer because everybody was very excited when submitting this paper telling us, you know what, it's a very nice detection. No one did it before. But what, where they come from? That's the big question. That's the question. Where, <laughs> exactly. So we start to think about it. And actually, as a first hint, naive question for Christine and me, who are not the expert, let's say, in meteorite, we said, you know what, mm -hmm. the only way to synthesize C60 any space is that how Kroto said, he said it should be synthesized around the stars. There is other theory about the synthesis okay. of C60. It's uh -huh. what we call it the top-down chemistry. So you go from a large pH, yeah. you strip it with UV and cosmic rays, and it will fall down inside the C60 ball. Yes. So both are basically argued in the astrophysical community. Here you can find this chemistry. Here you can find this chemistry. Both of these scenarios point to an interstellar origin. So when we start talking yeah. with Peter and with Serena and with the reviewer also, <laughs> we are sounding the paper. They said, you know what? You can't have that in your light because they don't believe that in your light you can keep interstellar grain because the body or the asteroid body has been differentiated. So they will not survive. Yeah. And Christine and me said, you know what? This molecule is one of the most stable molecule and it could resist temperature as and shock wave up to 2000 Kelvin. So they should survive. No one wanted to believe us on this point, I would say. Okay. So we came up with another story because there is two possibility. You could think about, because if I can explain it quickly. So al Mahatta Sitta or the Uralite parent body was a carbonaceous uh, body. It has been heated up to silicate melting and it has been differentiated. Okay. And at one moment it exploded. They call it the catastrophic disruption of this uralite parent okay. body. Okay. This right. explosion, this explosion uh, give birth to a, little, a lot of daughter fragments. Sure. Some That's... of them re-aggregated with other cosmic material and other meteorite. And okay. one of them was the TC3 2008 that basically had a collision and came to Earth. Okay. So okay. in the paper of 2010, we say that PAH came mm -hmm. from a carbonaceous cone, right? That hit basically the TC3 2008 Bang. and dispersed the PAH all around the body. Okay, that's very nice. Can we say that about the C60? We still discuss it and we didn't know. Okay. One of the first, one of the first, uh, or one of the models supposed for uh, basically the formation of fillerene that came out with the Christine because she knows this community very well. There is a paper for Isabel Cherchnev and uh, co worker where she showed that in some wall freight star that could be around our basically molecular cloud of solar system before the formation of our solar system. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. She simulated that you can synthesize basically C60 inside these stars with other basically short-lived nucleates. And these type of stars could basically rushize your molecular cloud before getting to the solar system body. Uh -huh. So that was one of our proposals that okay. we have two scenarios. One of them could be the hint, the, the collision, 
But mm-hmm. even that, there is no experimental data on that that a collision could produce C60. And if collision could produce C60, most of the meteorites that come to us have been, you know, following a lot of collision. Why we don't yeah, find yeah. C60 inside that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there is no experimental, and in the same time, we don't find C60. Okay. Yeah. So our astrophysical belief that the wolf rate star basically synthesizes and Russia yeah. one of the bodies that basically came to an Mahatta Sitta meteorites. Okay. And the problem is that it's just words, like you are putting hypothesis, you are putting basically line to be able to investigate. That. Yes. So that will be the next step. Actually, I will keep that for me for now because we have nice results. <laughs> oh, good, good. So, so good. that is part of the conclusion that we should look for these tolerance and yep. other meteorites and carbonaceous chloride and non carbonaceous chloride and a primitive meteorite. So for the moment we analyze, basically we are analyzing, if you want to yeah. a lot of these meteorites and we are doing some things that we didn't emphasize in this talk is that we are the only people, if I can say that, that analyze the bulk meteorites straight away. Okay. We don't touch the meteorite. We take the powder, the rock. I can show you one. Ooh, so that's me. one yeah. rock of al Mahat. Al oh. Mahatta Sitta. Uh, uh, let's take a look at that. There we go. Very cool. So that is, yeah. So we oh, have Al Mahatta Sitta. That is basically my, I would say, my, how we call it in English. On France, we say it's Port Bonaire, lucky things actually. Sample number four. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So actually, we are the only techniques that analyze the rock straight away. So a lot of the people in the meteorite community told us, you know what, most of the people analyze what we call insoluble organic material. Mm -hmm. So basically they dissolve everything in meteorites. Yes. They put some acid on it to remove all the mineral residue. So you are left up with everything that is matrix carbon that is not dissolvable in solution. Correct. So now we are studying basically at least six, seven meteorites and the different phases Mm -hmm. to be able to tell which or how fullerenes could be in this meteorite, not in this meteorite, and that could give us the origin. Cool. And I will leave that to the next paper, basically. <laughs> awesome. But so, yeah. so you, you did you did hint a couple of times there, um, you know, and toward the end um, uh, of, of paths forward. And so, um, yeah. let me ask, you know, where do we, other than your new your new publications coming? Um, you know, where, where do we go as a community, let's say, over the next two to five years? Or is there additional uh, observations that can be done? Maybe JWST can hit some, some of these things? Exactly. And That's, we, uh, yeah, because our team, Christine, and other researchers in our lab, like in the bigger team, they are very involved in the scientific program, the early scientific program okay. of JWST. Okay. And recently, I saw also there is an early scientific program of observing asteroids with JWST. Mm-hmm. And he, here is the whole picture that I'm trying to work on. Okay. So another exciting news that we get Hayabusa sample. We get the, old, uh, they made an offer called Hayabusa sample, the one from Ryugu sample, actually. Okay. And we just received the sample yesterday. So the whole question mm-hmm. is, beca- because the Ryugu sample is one of the most primitive, basically carbonaceous body that we know in our solar system. Okay. So mm-hmm. whatever we will detect inside it, PAH or fullerenes, will be compared to all our carbonaceous chondrite. And like that, you can really have a hint about the origin of these species. Yeah, nice. The problem until now, if you look to PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, what we see are small compared to the one in interstellar medium, which are huge. Right. Not in the insoluble organic material. I will leave that for after, for the paper after. But the interesting point about C60, why we are hunting now C60 in all these samples, is that you have restricted way of forming uh, C60. So or you form it around the stars, or you form it in the interstellar medium. So these are the two places where you can really think about the formation of C60. So if we detected in a carbonaceous, a pristine material that has not been differentiated, yes, we can say this question has been tackled down and we can use that later on 
if you think about the laser dissection laser ionization technique, we are at 300 micron, but in parallel, we are trying to reduce the size mm -hmm. of the laser to micron safety. If we develop more our sensitivity to C60 and we can see it in other meteorites, it could be used as an interstellar tracker or a chemistry tracker inside the sample by imaging yeah. the sample that you have. Yeah. So that's are the lines that we are working on in parallel to be able to basically to use this material as a tracker of chemistry of the carbonaceous stuff. So yeah, that is the future for us. <laughs> awesome. Very nice. Well, I certainly look forward to, uh, you know, there'll be some exciting developments over the next couple of years. So I'm really looking yes. forward to seeing that. It'd be very cool. And there is another thing about the 60 that we cannot do in our apparatus, but has been brought up by Baker. Because a lot of people, like how we say, it, said, okay, Baker didn't detect C60, it was an artifact. So now we are doing IOM of the same sample to see that. And I will not say the result, I will say it in the paper. <laughs> Okay, I'll be but, looking for it. I'll be looking but, for it. But she pointed up a very nice thing about what we call it a trapping noble gas inside C60. So mm -hmm. she did some yeah. nice experiment where yeah. she showed that we can detect noble gas that are trapped inside C60. Okay. So that is the interesting part about the C60 in meteorite. It's not to just to detect very exotic molecules that is very large, is that you can use it to track things actually yes. and track cosmochemistry. That is a nice part actually. Uh -huh. They're, they're yep. traps, right? Very cool. Exactly. Very exactly. Cool. All right. Awesome. Hassan, I want to thank you so much for walking thank us through you. your very lovely paper again. And everyone, that will do. And I hope this made your astronomy day or your astrochemistry day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.